Uh, today we're going to be uh, talking again in the first chapter of Ephesians. We're spending quite a bit of time in at the beginning of this series for important reasons. And today's passage is actually very, very short, but will set in motion much of what's going to happen in Paul's letter to the Ephesians and much of what was happening in that very church. Because remember, this isn't a church, this isn't a letter to all churches. It was written to a specific community in a specific time, and that was dealing with specific issues. And yet there's some universal things here that are such a gift for us in our day and in our time. And so I want to invite you to open with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 8b. We'll be going through the, uh, verse 10. Uh, today we're going to look at this small verse, and uh, it's so important because it'll frame the majority of what happens later here in the letter that Paul's writing, and where we get the title of this series, Out of Many, One. Out of Many, One. Okay? Paul writes, With all wisdom and understanding, he is, that is God, made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, as we all know, painfully, painfully, over the course of human history in the church, Jesus' followers, the same followers that Jesus prayed for unity in John's gospel, John chapter 15, the church has not had unity, has not been unified. There's been broken fellowship, broken unity, mostly around different interpretations and beliefs about how God works or what God's will is. The journey is of the church over the centuries, one where unity has often died used to be when we had the yellow pages. Do you remember the yellow pages? Anybody? Yeah? The next service, I bet people would be like, what are you talking about? Right. But yellow pages open up to churches, and you would see pages and pages of different churches of different stripes and different traditions, different branches, different beliefs, different ways, all calling themselves Christ's church. There's a story I love. A father of three tells it. He uh, is on a family vacation one summer. They crossed over into Wyoming and noted several historical points of interest. If you've ever driven through Wyoming, it's quite, a, quite an interesting state. The children were especially interested because they enjoyed the com computer game Oregon Trail. Do you remember this when we were kids, some of us? Yeah. And it gives the players a taste of what it was like to uh, endure the hardships that pioneers had to make from the Midwest coming all the way to the West Coast. And they stopped at the famous South Pass in Wyoming, uh, Fremont, Wyoming, to look at the wagon tracks that are still visible in the dirt Squinting out over the desolate, wind-swept landscape, his daughter nodded and said grimly, this is where my oxen always go to die. <laughs> you know, if you, if you study the, the history of the church, or if you look at the history of the church, there are several historical points of interest that we need to learn, learn from. And there are several places. One today I want to address where the church has gone to die. Church unity, the very thing Paul's talking about, has died. Read through this lens, the concept of unity and how unity breaks and how fellowship breaks, you can start to understand why there are so many fractures and breakups and the death of unity, the beloved, beautiful unity that God wants for God's church. This is something we don't talk about. We just don't do it. We don't talk very often about it because it's painful. And some of us ourselves have come from stories where we've come from churches where there were fractures or breakups or leadership problems or whatever, and it's a painful reality to talk about. This was a problem in the early church in Ephesus. You see, they didn't have a Bible like we knew it. They, they knew the Old Testament scriptures, but you had to go to the temple to, to of course, experience that. And Paul knew very, impor very important to them was their unity in Christ, to communicate the importance of their unity in Christ Jesus. In fact, we look at the history of our own church. It's 90-year history. If you have a chance out in the wayside sometime, look at the storyboard and just read the 90-year history of our church. And if you could believe it, 90 years that we're still together, and you see how important it has been for UPPC to protect its unity. And the fact is, this doesn't take much creativity or skill to break unity, especially in 
our day with so many divisions and perspectives and opinions. Anyone here like milk? Raise your hand. Anybody here like milk? Yeah. Anybody here like skim milk? You sick people. You sick people. Some of you actually just rose your hand on the skim milk question a little sheepishly. Right? Do you know how easy it is to divide this room? Anybody want to talk about who they voted for in the election? It takes very little skill to break people apart. It, it doesn't take much creativity at all. Our culture is so fine-tuned to this ability that we see it every day play out in social media and in the public sphere. But to protect what we agree on, what unifies us, that's the secret sauce. And with a world of such differing opinions and conflict, it's just so easy to break fellowship. And it's the state of our times. But then imagine what happens when a church loses its unity or the work that that unity requires Then you see what Paul was experiencing here in Ephesus. Disagreements. This is the first church. Holy Spirit was on the scene in the first church. And even there, there were disagreements and dissent and apathy and discouragement. Even a loss of purpose and mission about what they were supposed to be and do. And to that we read these words of God's heart through Paul's opening. God's heart is to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth, under who? Christ. Christ. Under Jesus. You know, one of the strongest New Testament Greek words that describes the early church, one of Paul's favorite words, one of Luke's favorite words in the book of Acts. Some of people forget that Luke wrote Luke's gospel as well as the book of Acts. And it's one of the favorite words of the New Testament to describe this unity. But unity doesn't quite capture it. See, the word is homothumadon. Say it with me. Homothumadon, right? Rolls off the tongue. Right? Homothumadon. It's one of those words that probably shouldn't have been translated, honestly. Like hallelujah or hosanna. They don't translate those words into some form of English. They just leave it in the original languages because the word itself has such power. Are you following me? Homothumadon. Homothumadon is usually translated to have unity or to be with one accord, or one mind. So we read in the New Testament, they were gathered, the early disciples, they were gathered in the upper room, homothumadon. We read that the followers were gathered at the disciples' feet to hear their teaching, homothumadon, because they were of one mind. When Peter and John were put in jail, the believers came together to pray that they would be released so that the gospel could move forward, homothumadon, with one unity. And as we read Paul's words to the Ephesians in this book, his charge for us, his charge for that church, was to make every effort to keep or protect the unity of the Spirit. Homo thumadon. To make every effort to keep or protect the unity of the Spirit. Say it with me. Homo thumadon. It is precious. And the problem with the, with the translation of this word is it's just too weak. It comes from the preposition homo, which means the same, and then thumos, which is an emotion. It's a passion. It's a fire. It's a fervency, much like we have towards the mariners right now. Okay? What? No? We've got to pray. No. It carries with it just that hunger. It's a thirst. It's a protective anger towards one unity, one mind that we have in Christ Jesus. In the English, we just can't get the thumas in there. We can't get the passion, the fire, the emotion, the intensity of it. And so why do we have church fractures and disagreements? Well, let me help you understand how this works. And this is something that came to me years ago. Pastor Jim Mead shared it with our leadership team. Pastor Jim Mead is a pastor emeritus of this church, one of the Uh, great gifts to this church and to me as my pastor and friend. And he taught the concept called the bounded set of beliefs that that often are held in the church versus the uh, centered set. And what I mean by bounded set of beliefs is that we have these things we call tenets. 
theological beliefs that come from the scripture from church tradition, okay? And uh, I have this, this bundle of reeds, and it's a little bit like this, okay? Imagine the, the, the hundreds of, or, you know, say 150 essential tenets, things we believe, things we stand on that unify us in the bounded set, if you believe in the bounded set. The bounded set is very, very common in a lot of churches. Some of us grew up in churches like this. I did. And the bounded set, the primacy of Jesus Christ, stands right against other theological beliefs. Maybe things that aren't so essential, but they're all bound together. Believe one, you believe all. Sacrifice one, you've sacrificed all. In fact, I know of a particular person in... uh, Adult education in a Baptist church, old story, was that he was a good Baptist. He believed all of the teachings of the church. He taught them for years and years, was quite gifted. But one day in his teaching, he taught something different. What do you think they did to him? What do you think his uh, role as teacher would be after that moment? Gone. Gone. You violated the scriptures. You violated the teaching of the church. That's the problem with the bounded set. The bounded set holds all essential tenets, all, or excuse me, all tenets uh, in general together. And many of us grew up in traditions that followed this theological conviction about how the church is to be. Okay. Problem is, it places the really important Let me say this again. It places the really important tenets alongside the less so important. And it presumes the mystery of God. Remember Paul's words first in this passage? Remember those words? He says, with all wisdom and understanding, God made known to us the mystery of his will. That's a key phrase. The mystery of his will is in Christ Jesus. Not in theological tenets where we remove the mystery of God's will and way but in Christ Jesus. And so it presumes in this bounded set that the mystery of God's will, as Paul has said in this passage, is actually, you know what, it's knowable. We can, we can just bind these together with a big rope and uh, live out of that bounded set. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm fumbling with this thing. It's probably getting a little annoying, but, but you get the point, okay? Had the early church held these tenets from the very beginning... If the bounded set had continued throughout time, this is where we would be. Circumcision would still be required for every person in this room. Or Christians would no longer be bound by much that is found in the law of Moses. Uh, uh, But we would still be worshiping on Saturdays, by the way. We would uh, be eating only what is kosher, offering animal sacrifices, administering capital punishment for everything from working on the Sabbath to the rebelliousness uh, on the part of children. How do we like that? Further, if we consistently applied the same assumptions about all beliefs held together, okay, then we'd have to apply the assumptions about what Paul teaches about women in the New Testament and the female members of UPPC in this room would pray with their heads covered and they would remain silent in the church. They would not be permitted to teach in any church gathering where men were present. That's tough, isn't it? And some churches, by the way, if you haven't traveled much, still believe that tenet, that women are to, are to be quiet and to be modest and cannot, cannot wear pants in church. God forbid, right? The problem with bounded set is it places everything on equal footing. Now, The centered set is something different. Now, here I'm just going to use the same analogy, but the centered set is what our tradition follows. And we believe in the essential essential tenets of the Christian faith. They're actually in your bulletin, okay, underneath the order of service. We believe there are essential tenets that our officers, our pastors, and elders must agree on, okay? Ten essential tenets. But the primacy of those tenets are the first two, the mystery of the triune God and the eternal word of God in Christ Jesus. It's the same thing Paul just said in our passage, that everything will be unified. Everything will be unified in Christ Jesus. But we hold to a centered set. 
Now, does that mean that these other theological beliefs or theological disagreements or theological struggles or positions don't matter? Not at all. They do matter. There's a big, big pile of things that we have to deal with to live our faith in practice under the banner of the Lordship of God and of Christ Jesus. But we don't break fellowship over those things. We don't fracture the unity of the church over those things. We can agree to disagree over those things. We have to find a way. But what we agree on, at least for our officers, are the ten essential tenets. Now, what's interesting is members, some of you may know this, but some of you have been members, maybe became members years and years ago, is there's only one thing that's required to be a member in the Presbyterian Church and in our church. You know what that is? To proclaim the lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. And with that, of course, means that Jesus is Lord and, and is freeing you from the power of sin so that you can be a Christ follower. But it's about the lordship of Jesus. That's, that's the only thing, the one thing that binds us all together is Jesus. The lordship of Jesus. All others are important. There's a lot of things that we have to think through, a lot of really complex things. But we can also disagree or change our mind over time, like we've done with discernment over the many, many years in the church. What do we believe theologically, friends, about refugees? What do we believe theologically about modes of baptism? Immersion versus sprinkling versus pouring. What do we believe about tithing? You want to get uncomfortable? We've we've discerned these things over many years. And there are differing minds on these subjects and disagreements, and that is okay because the homothumadon, the one mind, is still around the essentials. It's still around the primacy of Jesus Christ. I've had conversations with some folks these days about much of what they are feeling about me and the Embrace series we just came out of. And I say, again, you can disagree with your pastor. You can disagree on this conversation about Embrace because it's something we can disagree with and still keep our homothumadon, our unity, and our one-mindedness in Christ. Unless... Unless you're operating out of the bounded set. And some people feel comfortable with the bounded set and feel better with the bounded set. And in many of conversations I've had these days, I, I say, you know, I think, I think you don't have a problem with the ten essential tenets. You're just struggling because you have an eleventh. And that eleventh central tenet is worth breaking fellowship over. And that breaks my heart. All of us, at some point or another, all of us, from the very beginning of the church to now, have had an 11th tenet. We've had something that we cared so deeply about and we thought this is worth breaking fellowship, breaking unity, breaking homothumadon over. But The liberating truth and the liberating thing for what it means to be Presbyterian or part of the Reformed tradition that we're within is that the centered set is liberating. It is freeing. It lets us have unity on the essentials and then to work out and grind through the discernment that's required to live in our day, in our age. The Bible doesn't say anything about nuclear power. The Bible doesn't say anything about mass weapons of destruction and defense against our enemies in the form of kind of military power that we know now. There's so many things we have to discern. We have to trust the Holy Spirit. And we can still keep our unity. Are you hearing me, friends? I hope so. It's freeing when we come back to the centered set. And the key word that Paul uses is that Jesus, when it is all said and done, will unify everything in the created world, both in heaven and on earth. And that fulfillment, all of it, will come together, not in a list of laws 
or doctrines or those who got the beliefs right or those who behaved rightly. It's going to come together and be fulfilled in the person of Jesus who, who pours out his love and his life for each of us, sinners. And so as we consider unity today, we aren't learning a list of to-dos or a bounded, strict set of beliefs that we must adhere to. We have to follow the way of unity, which is the spirit of Christ in a community of people. This is ultimately unity, according to Paul, and as we'll read in the coming weeks, a spiritual matter. It is a spiritual thing. It's not an intellectual thing. It is a spiritual issue. And as we consider Paul's words to the Ephesians, we find that we don't have unity because of each other or because of this room or because of this church or because of a worship style or because of an affinity or because we all live in the same city. We have unity together because of one thing. And I hope this, I hope this stirs your heart. We have unity because of one thing. Jesus Christ crucified. Amen? Amen. Do you know how many churches there are in Pierce County? If you look on the yellow pages, look online, there's about 970 churches in Pierce County. Can't you believe that? According to Ephesians, according to Paul, how many churches are in Pierce County? One church. One church. One church in Christ, if we could all figure that out, be unified under that lordship, while we're working out the difficulties of other things, not to dismiss those, but if we could center ourselves on the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whose death wrote our names on the ribbon of life and draped that ribbon on the cross in order to save us from our sins. And the mystery of unity is later described by Paul when he says this, and I'll close. We are one body through one spirit. We have one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. Jesus. Let me pray. Lord, may it be so that we could withhold the temptation always in our lives to place the unifying oneship, the homothumadon that you purchased for us, front and center, the centerpiece of our theology and a centered set where we can agree on the essentials and then work out the non-essentials together with faith and hope and love. Help us to protect the unity of our church always here at EPPC, the gift that you have given us by the Holy Spirit. And through that unity, that we could show our world, our community, our neighbors, the powerful unifying love of Jesus that takes our differences and makes them beautiful. It makes it possible for us to worship and have fellowship together. And so today we pray for the unity of our own hearts. And maybe some of us have struggled to keep that home of Thumadon, or maybe we've neglected the work of homothumadon. Renewing us once again. A centered set mentality. Where we don't break fellowship, we don't break union with each other and with you. We keep ourselves centered on the risen Christ. Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Maybe so in this church from its inception 90 years ago to today and so far on into the future, the great future you have planned for this church. I pray and we pray in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen.